I'm here to deliver some bad news, first of all. Sorry. The first thing is that someday, eventually, every single one of you and me included will die. The second piece of bad news I have is that the last thing that we'll do on this earth is poison it. That's because both, both cremation and conventional burial are polluting and toxic practices. With conventional burial, bodies are pumped full of formaldehyde-laden embalming fluid and then buried in a casket in a concrete-lined grave in a cemetery. Besides the waste, there's the problem of land use, and cemeteries from New York to Shanghai and, yes, Austin, Texas, are reaching capacity. Cremation is the other available option, and it's actually quickly becoming the default, in part because people think it's the more sustainable choice. But the truth is that cremation destroys our potential to give back to the Earth after we die. It uses an energy-intensive process to turn bodies into ash and emits around 600 million pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from the U.S. alone. But I'm not just here to, to give you the bad news, I've got some good news too. Um, my name is Katrina Spade, I'm the founder and director of the Urban Death Project. And we've created a new system called recomposition that transforms bodies into soil so that we can give back to the earth after we die. This patent pending system is based on years of research in uh, livestock mortality composting, a process that's been proven through decades of research. And it works by creating the right environment so that thermophilic microbes and beneficial bacteria can do their jobs. And these tiny creatures break down our bodies, the carbon and the protein in our bodies, to create a nutrient-rich soil, much like what's happening here on the forest floor. But we're not just developing a new system of disposition to replace cremation and burial. We're also creating a new model of death care. In the future, we envision every center, every city will have a recomposition center designed for the community in which it serves. Imagine it. Part public park, part funeral home, part memorial to the people we love. Gardens will be nourished from the soil created by the deceased as they are folded back into the communities in which they've lived. In addition, we believe that participating in the care of a loved one after they die can be a profound experience. Our staff will be trained to support grieving families, not to take over for them. And each recomposition center will have a shrouding room where families can prepare their dead to be transformed from human to soil. Okay, that's where we're going. Here's where we are now. Our team is an incredible mix of engineers, architects, legal strategists, and soil scientists. And in the past two years since founding, we've developed our business plan, crafted legal strategy, and completed the design of this patent pending system. In the next few months, we'll build a prototype of our system at Washington State University and run a pilot program in collaboration with their soil sciences department. And then, we'll build the first ever recomposition center in Seattle, Washington, and then create a toolkit so that design teams in cities everywhere can design and build their own centers. Recomposition is a way for our deaths to be more like our lives full of meaning and a deep respect for the earth. One more thing. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and welcome to the death care revolution. It's an exciting time to be alive. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? A moment of stunned silence. <laughs> Well, it's you know, interesting. Uh, while, while you're thinking of questions, generally it varies by culture, but two of the top fears are dying and public speaking. Uh, so, <laughs> I do have a question. It's more of a, as weird it sounds, it's a capacity question. How, how big for a city like Seattle would this facility need to be? 
Actually, that is a really great question because um, the scale of our first facility is to handle 850 bodies a year, which is a very small fraction. It's about 3% of King County's annual deceased. It's nothing. All right. So really, it's about creating this model and then spreading the model using our toolkit in probably more ways than one that we haven't designed yet, in fact. But it, so the, the method of disposition is scalable in the same way that crematories are. But uh, we haven't quite figured out that model, if that makes sense. Uh, is there a precedent for what you're doing? I mean, I, I'm interested in the history of how did we end up with cremation and formaldehyde as opposed to this, which seems like the more, the less effort, actually. I mean, in a lot of ways. You oh, know, it like, is. Well, I, I could go on forever about the funeral industry because it's really fascinating, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> the reason we are where we are is a kind of a combination of uh, for-profit, um, sales-based funeral industry and historical happenstance. It's not, as many people think, really based on religion or even like really custom. I mean, it's our custom now, but it's a little bit more happenstance than that. Um, and I should say that embalming really only happens with much regularity in the US and Canada. So it's not a worldwide thing. It's something that we do because we think we need to, and we don't. Um, and then cremation has just become the default because it's simpler, it's easier, it's cheaper, and people think it's sustainable. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> I'll say for the record, the next city actually covered your work in April of last year, and uh, we had a lot of readers who wrote back. And I guess part of the challenge is trying to figure out the social resilience of all of this, right? Understanding changes and attitudes going through. Um, how have you addressed that, and how do you think um, you can communicate that in the future? And in a lot of ways, this is a let's build it and they will come situation. And I feel like that's maybe a little bit of a, a workaround, but the truth is, um, our, our uh, Current built environment, crematories, funeral homes, and even cemeteries don't resonate for many people. So even if you set aside the form of disposition that we've we've created and are bringing to market, we're going to make spaces that feel like community spaces that resonate somehow. And I mean that's going to look different in every city, but that will bring people alone. And then when you tie in this uh, a system that's more, more meaningful for people, I, I don't think it's going to be hard to get the cultural. You know, there's already a, a lot of interest. So. Any other questions? One question is, what is the cost comparison? Because the US, in the US, burial costs are astronomical because of everything that needs to be done. So what is it, how does it compare? So what we've been working with for our business model is a cost that comes in less than the um, average for a cremation with a funeral. Now, not, not just an average cremation can be anywhere from 300 to $1,000 if it's just a cremation, but then if you add in a funeral, it's gonna be more like 6,000 in the US. And our goal is to come in under that. And also to create a culture of giving and a nonprofit structure that is about you know paying more when you can. Not a strict sliding scale, but something that is really more thoughtful than the current, the current industry paradigm we have. Great, thank you. Thank you.